welcome to my talk. I'm David G. Um, I blog on Dave.dev previously of ipengineer.net, uh, and I just have to throw out there that I happen to work for a big bad vendor in Juniper. Uh, I won't be talking about Juniper uh, in this presentation. It's not a sales pitch, and this really is a brain dump of some uh, kind of scientific query quandaries, frustration, uh, and some other kind of things I've been dealing with for the last 12 months. And all of that frustration is embedded into this deck. Now, um, I will say as well, part of this talk has been given at one of the Irish network operator groups. Um, it was quite well received, lots of interest uh, from both the scientific community and just kind of from the, uh, the normal cynics. So hopefully, if you take nothing away from this, um, other than a bit of frustration, maybe the, uh, the presentation was a success. So uh, I've been in the networking space and the software space for quite a while now. Uh, and, and what kind of frustrated me early on was how everybody seems to jump to a device, run some CLI commands to try and figure out what a node in a graph was doing. Um, and graph theory is one of those things where I'm, I'm no mathematician, I'm not an expert. I've learned enough to be dangerous. Um, but from what I did learn, it turns out that if you apply the fundamentals of graph theory to everything in networking, then it really becomes a data traversal problem in a graph. Um, and networking, therefore, you can see from the, uh, the graphic on the right-hand side of the screen there, can be represented quite easily uh, in, a, in a graph database, that the problem ultimately is getting data, meaningful data, from those graph nodes. Um, so that might be a firewall, it might be a router, it might be a switch. Uh, and luckily, there's lots of industry uh, movements happening to help us do that stuff. Um, graphs can also contain more than just state. So we can actually contain workflows on them as well. Uh, that means we can deal with things like configuration management as well as operational states. And what's really interesting is when we start talking about self-driving. But ultimately, and this is really the, the title of the talk, I kind of started viewing network operations as a load of pirates going off on the seven seas looking for treasure, but they, they didn't have a map. And I, I've, it's kind of stuck with me for quite a while that this is a weird state of affairs that we have uh, in networking. Um, so anybody that's done anything at all in automation, uh, network automation, uh, will see immediately the relationship between um, a graph, a cyclic graphs, as in there is a start point, uh, a series of nodes, you can traverse those nodes and you can pass data through those nodes or the nodes may affect the data uh, in, a, in another system. Uh, and ultimately they have um, an endpoint. Some graphs are entirely cyclic and they never exit. And a lot of software systems can be modeled like this. Some people also refer to these as uh, label transition systems. And if, uh, again, if mathematics is your thing, some of this is really, really quite simple. Uh, but once you start fundamentally seeing how to change uh, a node, so again, a, a network device in a very, very simple way that takes part in a much larger graph, the, uh, the, the notions of, of graph theory really become uh, quite important. Uh, and then we start talking about like products uh, and how kind of, um, I guess those turnkey products like Cisco's ACI, um, they really embrace certain aspects of, of graph theory. And even if you go and try and design a service, you're very much in this mode of thinking when you, when you design these things. Another beautiful thing about this is networking really is never in an end state. Um, so even if you're a professional services person, if you're an operations person, and you're looking at the network as a means to uh, deliver service, as in you, you start on Monday by Friday, your network better be open, better be delivering services, your exit might be Friday, but the network itself never, ha never has uh, an end state. There are always changes, movers, ads, and changes happening. Um, and the graphs give you a really powerful aspect here, as in you can not only model um, what, is, what is possible and what you need to do, you can verify that it has been done, but there's enough data embedded into the system um, to always allow you to, to move forward on this kind of um, infrastructure without an end state kind of uh, approach. Um, but the more you tend to look at automation systems and automator, uh, and whether that's uh, cellular automation or, or really, really just kind of like, you know, simple A, A, element A affects element B, and there's some stuff that happens in the transition, how A uh, affects B. Um, the, the more you start breaking problems down into this space, um, the more I just got frustrated. So uh, a few years ago, having conversations with kind of fellow network engineers and really trying to automate some of these things in a, in a very meaningful way that we can make abstract enough where it's not 
not overly complex, uh, but it gives us the power of things like verification and assertability uh, and modeling. We want to be able to model these things. Um, and, and it just, the more I thought about it, the more my gears got cranked out of line in terms of uh, being frustrated. Um, and the frustration ultimately came down to me analyzing the industry at great length and then having a bit of a nervous breakdown, not a real nervous breakdown, but a bit of a, a bit of an issue. Um, because all it seems that we've really perfected at this point is we've automated the keyboard. We've taken what otherwise would be generating some human uh, readable and human kind of generatable configuration. And we've thrown it right into um, a, a machine and we said, hey, automate this for us. So what have we really done? Well, we, we've separated the data that typically goes into a set of repetitive or repetitious uh, uh, commands. So we've given that over to a tool like Ansible, Puppet or Chef. Uh, and then we have this magic module that, that generates and renders new configuration and pushes it down to the device. Um, and if we look back and um, if we widen our blinkers in terms of the, this very uh, high level graph approach of how everything is connected and how bits of data, where, whether that's config data or operational data flows end to end that allows us to model all we've done at this point is we've sped up uh, how we get config from our brains or from designs into um into a device um we, we still haven't got any real uh, any any real closer to to automation an automator um comes from a, a greek word that i i can't write or pronounce uh, but the rough translation is for self-making um and ansible and terraform and all of the current tools and infrastructure uh, as code tools uh automator today self-making is not you know, we, we, we've got a very long way to go in terms of really having that kind of uh, the power we all talk about um, but what about unit tests and all these things these are all great steps and i'm not saying it isn't good enough but i'm also saying it isn't good enough uh, from an automation point of view i always think about things uh, in these kind of huge kind of connect connected graphs uh, not so much as cycle times and going through tools which leads me to some to some frustration uh, as you can probably hear in my voice um, so where are we as an industry if we take these kind of viewpoints into account? Well, we have the business and the business sits on top of a network. Uh, we have different teams managing that. And really what we've done is we've affected, we've affected a really tiny aspect of our business. We've maybe sped some of our jobs up, uh, but we haven't necessarily improved anything. Um, we, we might have got a little bit more time back in the day, which might allow us to change some things, uh, but we haven't really gained any awareness of, of anything around us. We've not managed to um, query the systems and all the systems and how they're dependent on each other. Um, it's a bit of a bit of a poor state of affairs, really. Um, and again, um, just if, if you're new to network automation, um, I'm not trying to put you off. The entry level very much is you grab some templates and that might be in the parlance of whatever device that you have. So if I think about, you know, Cisco it might be iOS, there might be some, some Junos, there might be some Vios, um, whatever. So we create some human readable templates. We remove the inputs. Um, we then have host information of where the data is going to go. We have variables then that go back into the templates. That might be a VLAN number, a description. Uh, we might have some other, other directives, but we put all those things together. We render some config via it all. And then we almost push blindly the device. Um, and going back to the graph piece, we might have an instance where we have two empty, uh, empty devices or we're trying to stand up a service. So maybe the interfaces on these devices, the device is doing other things, but we have two new revenue ports that we need to bring up and face each other. So we bring up a port, we stick a, an IP address on. Um, so you can see inet.1 slash 30 uh, in the middle set of routers there uh, and inet.2 slash 30 on the, on, the bottom, uh, on the bottom router there. If we've done our job right and the templates are correct and the host variables are correct and all, everything else is correct and the tools have connected to the right device devices and the devices have accepted these human readable configs, we might get to a point on the right hand side where the link comes up successfully, but we've got no guarantees on that. And even if the argument is presented, well, what about databases, Dave? And what about um, YAML files where we can store all these variables? Okay, that's, that's great, but we still don't get any assurances that all it means is if we, we've moved the book, somebody else more diligent now has to manage those variables further up the stack. So confidence is a bit of a problem here. Visibility is a bit of a problem. Uh, and growing this thing properly and organically, um, we still haven't solved. Um, and then what really made me chuckle uh, as part of the, the journey in terms of trying to describe these frustrations, I saw a Family Guy episode. Um, so I thought, well, this is going to explain things beautifully. And it's a real gear grinder. Um, it, it's been really difficult for me to kind of swallow that the state of automation has probably quite made me... Um, 
uh, unpopular maybe uh, especially I'm trying to kind of quest myself on on social media and keep myself quiet um, and ultimately what's missing in all of our efforts around automation it's not the, na the, 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 the next great library or the next great tool it's a graph it's a it's a graph. I'm not going to swear. And it's obviously a light swear word. Uh, and the more I think about operations and all of the challenges and trials and tribulations, uh, if we thought about things more in, in terms of how they're connected end to end, we'd be in a much, much, much better place. Um, Jeff Sussner is, is a guy that I want to just kind of briefly talk about. And um, he wrote a book called Designing Delivery. And you think about problems in terms of product delivery or service delivery, not just build it, throw it over the fence and run for the hills, but how do you roll out um, a product deep within the business to make it harmonious. So if we're going to automate the stand up of a service on the network, we want to do that thing. So it's absolutely reliable. Well, that means having knowledge of how operations might want to um, observe that the new service comes up. They might want to take some metrics and baseline it for the first few days to make sure there aren't any snags or any any weird issues. Um, the amount of times I've seen services come up and they've not worked. And then you, know, you pick the phone up and you have a chat with support and you get nothing but frustration. Um, and it's really where we are as an industry. And I think we've gone so far down the path of uh, making everything efficient and everything so damn optimal. We've missed the art as well of, of injecting change into the business. Which brings me right back to the graph, because if we can model everything onto uh, a, a very large graph and we can see how everything affects each other, how everything is related, even operations can work on the same system. Instead of having one system for provisioning and one, uh, one system for monitoring and alerting and, and auto remediation, and everything else, um, I still see that the businesses is, is massively fragmented. Um, and uh, the, the, the kind of traditional, I say traditional classic network automation approaches where really we're kind of stuck in the lands uh, of, of tools like um, Ansible or independent um, efforts. So take a Python library, write some scripts. Um, well, Big news, a lot of people were doing this with Perl years and years and years ago. And um, and even uh, languages like PHP, just because we change the language, we pick a new tool up, it doesn't mean we've actually progressed. It's just a, the same old thing with a new name. Um, but unfortunately, it's not progression. Um, and this is, again, it's another gripe. It really grinds my gears that we talk about dev and DevOps and SecOps and SaaSOps. Um, we're not really improving things. We can talk about it. We can be aware of it. Having awareness and reading the books doesn't really move us any more forward. And the more <laughs> the more I deal with this, the more frustrated I get to a point where um, this is where this this presentation came around. Um, so back to, back in the INOG days, somebody said, "Ah, oh, you know, we know you've uh, you, you talk about this stuff a lot. You're frustrated with this. Do you want to present it?" And I, I don't because all I can do is get angry about this stuff. There's this great big black hole in the middle uh, of every automation system. And even if we think about the, the 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 road that we've trod, we talk about things like open daylight and yeah, but we can go net comp from there to here. Um, the information that goes into those systems is still quite isolated. It still comes from a spreadsheet. It still comes from an isolated database. Um, there's no great um, record, um, a system of record underneath to help us analyze, verify, query in, in one kind of, and I, I don't want to say pane of glass, but I almost want to say one layer of normalization. Um, and the, the panacea really is if we can bring all these things together um, and, and move things forward. Uh, I can't really underestimate though the the power of being able to have that layer of, of normalization. Um, and right now we can talk about JSON and XML and YAML and Python and Go and all these different tools. Um, but all these tools uh, and language formats and, and metadata types and data representation systems, they're only tiny elements in a, in a much larger system. And I very much came to the conclusion as an industry and when we're talking about network automation and network orchestration, self-driving, self-healing and all these different things, that um, we actually lack complete ability to even describe what it is that, that we want to do. So I was in electronics way before I was in networking. Um, and even looking at a little simple circuit like this, immediately you recognize the components and ultimately you go, well, I don't need to build this to understand that the chances are this is a flip-flop circuit and LEDs are gonna, they're gonna flip-flop between themselves. And then you can go off and you can take the resistor values and the capacitor values, which aren't, aren't on the, the, the diagram, unfortunately, but then you could figure out the flash rate through scientific means. We don't have that. What we do in networking is we've selected a tool and everything's fantastic. We're gonna pay more tax because our business is gonna grow. Um, and it's it's just a little bit disappointing 
we're, we're not anywhere closer to solving this than we were a, a few years ago. And, and yes, there are systems out there. Um, they're kind of dealing with uh, declarative content um, and, and intent. Um, but in terms of being able to model, drive, operate, verify, assert, um, and rapidly troubleshoot, we, we can't do those things. In terms of self-driving, how does a car self-drive? Well, we need an inordinate amount of data coming into the vehicle to be able to do those things. Um, well, the data is beginning to hit devices now through telemetry um, and standardization of, of data objects. We can take open config, for instance, which is helping us to bring some taxonomy and some structure to the data that we need to be able to build these systems. But I also don't think it's a machine learning problem. A lot of a lot of people have turned around and said, "Oh well, you know, what about AI and ML?" Well, do I really want to trust the uh, I don't know an ISP or carrier network? Do I want to hand the control over to that to the equivalent of a two or three year old just because there's loads and loads of data that's gone into those systems? Does it really mean that the decision uh, is going to be made how we want it to be? We can't really trust those systems to be able to. To, to calculate, especially, I think, in one of the talks I saw not long back, um, one of the algorithms, I think it was one of the Google image algorithms, couldn't tell the difference between a desert and a, an Apache helicopter. You know, imagine if that's a, a flow spec record. Oops, we, we you know, given away the keys to the kingdom. Not only have we paid more taxes, but the kingdom is, uh, has been defeated. Um, an automator is generally a lot more complex, and this is really the, the, the bottom line. I don't like the reading from slides too much, but it's just more complex than a set of if-else statements, so self-driving and self-healing. Um, if we have if-else statements, sure, we can generate a signal that is meaningful and it has context within the, the bounds of the if-else statements. But when it comes to uh, external dependencies and, and what are the inputs that we can query for, we don't have good means of doing that without a human getting involved. Um, so... Given all of this, this chatter over, um, over graphs, you know, where could we be? Well, if we could represent configuration in our kind of desired state in terms of graph, um, and if we could take information uh, from ops and put it back onto the same graph, um, we have two things. We have our desired state and a means to regulate or coalesce uh, the actual real world devices. Um, against the, the config graph and we can then uh, keep an open loop open so or a closed loop sorry we can take information from the graph we can push it down to the device and we can verify in a check based on signals and events so say if uh, a commit has been received on a device um, the the information contained on the configuration graph uh, a, a small subsystem could do a verification you know is the configuration of the device the same as us on the graph um, and this is really quite important because if only a, a small portion of the graph changes we can also isolate parts of a configuration standards that we, that we know are going to have changed, um, which is important if humans are still fiddling around with other little uh, pieces of, of configuration around the edge of the network, which they're invariably going to do. There is no, there is no hard um, do or don't, I think, in this arena. Lots of conversations come up with uh, to make automation reliable. Well, let's just ban the humans. Well, in, in that case, actually, we slow the business down because simple problems can't be solved. You know, if you ring up a bank, uh, I've got a friend who um, he took on a, a one gigabit uh, Ethernet connection in Milton Keynes. And it turns out um, it was a product that didn't exist. It was kind of like a marketing product. And now he's stuck on the system and can't get off the system because nobody built the process to, the, to remove him, um, which is kind of laughable. But it's a good example if we make hard and uh, cold decisions on, on this, we, we're going to cause more problems. We have to be flexible. So the idea is if our configuration graph um, is aware of the changes uh, that, it's, that it's asserting on, on devices, on real world devices, and there's a system that can um, double check for those, th those changes, it means that somebody else can change some other data on the system. Uh, without fear of the system doing a hard reset because a you know whole a small part of configuration has changed, where the system tries to reinforce and um, push back um, the the last known commit for the whole configuration, which is I think terrifying in my mind's eye, especially if we think about ISPs uh, and IXPs. We don't want to be in a position where we're deleting the whole configuration, regenerating, and leaving it down to the network operating system to figure out how to do the delta. And I've just realised I've talked about the config piece quite a <laughs> quite a bit there, um, but the, the whole that the union between ops and configuration almost is like this kind of DevOps. If, if our dev is the config and our ops is in terms of kind of this uh, assertion validation dealing with failure, this kind of constant discovery and absolute knowledge of what it is that we've done from the config, we can almost look at this as a DNA system. You know, our human bodies is, is built from a small set of building blocks, but it's actually quite a complex machine when we look at it uh, in the kind of cold, cold light of day. And that, that kind of spurred me on to something else. Um, a lot of our infrastructure is code tools. 
are actually really quite simple. We've took a, a model from a network operating system. We've then created a data type in some language. Now, whether that's been represented in another, another data form, it doesn't really matter. Um, but it does quite a poor job. So if we think about this as a machine to machine problem and everybody's been talking about IOT and machine to machine communications, well, this is one of those, one of those things. Um, our IAC tools, our infrastructure as code tools don't do a very good job of talking machine back to a, back to a higher level system. Um, there is one tool out there that does though, and that is Terraform. And with Terraform, providing that the, the southbound provider that goes off and talks to those devices is being built with proper resource handling in mind. And this is not a pass through of CLI commands or REST commands, which I've seen a few out there like that, but actual resources. So uh, a bit of a cliche example would be uh, VLANs. If we create a VLAN in Terraform for a known provider that handles resources, what we'll actually have is a set of uh, HCL uh, key values that go into the configuration for that VLAN. So that might be a VLAN name, a VLAN number, a VLAN description, plus a few other fields, maybe some ports where it's applied, but it's represented in terms of um, a proper resource within, um, within Terraform. Now, interestingly, Terraform itself then runs a, a graph internally, an acyclic graph. It organizes the resources in terms of dependencies, tells you, the operator, what it is that it's going to do. And that also might be to close a delta if there has been a, been a change or a move uh, of, of data. And then using a southbound connection goes off to a device uh, and implements said configuration. Now, what Terraform doesn't do is there isn't a Terraform of Terraform. So we still have to deal with um, directories of configuration per device. And, but within that device, um, ultimately, Terraform can, can handle um, the, the acyclic graph now. I've had a, a couple of people say, well, you could, uh, you could apply Terraform to the whole network wide. Um, but then what you've done, unless you go off and, and handle um, small changes independently, um, or if you go off and handle small changes independently, what you end up with is, is the kind of master, um, let's call it the, the umbrella Terraform being relatively unaware of what's going on. So Terraform is great if we think about this per device. Now, the lovely thing is Terraform with a, a, a provider that's been built the right way to handle southbound resources correctly, it will tell you in JSON form about its metadata or, or uh, structure. So it will tell you what fields a VLAN resource accepts or a BGP peer accepts, which becomes very interesting when we start thinking about things in graph format, um, because it means we now have an IEC tool that talks machine language to um, potentially a high level orchestrator that understands all the capabilities that Terraform has for a, a given device. Um, it's really quite an important point that can't be, can't be understated. So what happened at this point um, was uh, two, two and a half years ago from this point, um, I built a experimental Terraform provider for Junos. Um, and it only did kind of four or five things. It did something like a, a VLAN, a BGP peer, um, an interface uh, from, a, from a, a layer three point of view, and also applying a VLAN to uh, an access port or a trunk port. It was all relatively straightforward. But what I managed to do was get, and this is a recent addition to the experiment, I managed to get Terraform to describe to me what it could do to these devices. And I created canonical examples of those things and then placed them on a graph almost as an intent. So the intent actually is the inputs that go to the IAC tools, um, but it allowed us to, or allowed me certainly to try and start moving out of the realm of frustration into a realm of real um, and changing things. Um, so long story short, I went off and probably heads down for a good six months last year in all my spare time went into this um i i wrote i don't know how many lines of code at this point probably several hundred thousand um it's all built on the back of neo4j which is a graph database um 99 of code is in go there's only one module in python and that's uh, quite a novel uh, element um i'll go into that in a moment all communication um, that, that drives this graph is based on NATS, which is a message bus, well, a kind of message bus, often called uh, an ear and mouth message bus. Uh, and Google protocol buffers is the, um, the means of me um, transmitting data between those components and gluing things together. Um, so what we have right now 
or what I have right now is a means of discovering some basic topology, which is what you see in front of you. That includes devices like our interfaces. Um, there is a taxonomy tree, which is not on this graph, but I think it might be on the next one, um, where we can pin things like um, state of BGP, um, peers, ASNs, or whatever. It, really important operational information we can have in a known um, structure and known tree. Uh, and then we can place the desired intent um, onto the graph in terms of how we want our configuration. And then what happens is there's a global signal system that runs. Um, so once I've made all these changes, I create a snapshot, hashes are stored of all the, the subtrees and the trees, and then I run a, a reconciliation event. And what happens is system agents responsible for devices, um, they log into the graph, they do a query and say, right, tell me everything I need to know about the desired state of MX01. Um, and it breaks down into small Terraform files, and then any deltas are dealt with by the agent. The agent um, deals with the device, it's had the signal, proceed, go make the change. And then it does a verify, comes back and providing that the, the device now looks like the graph, um, we come back with a with, with an, all, an all clear. And you could almost look at this scientifically like an, an eventual consistency approach to dealing with network configuration. Um, now this, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much pain some of these things uh, have, have kind of, well, how much have been inflicted on me. It took me um, about two and a half weeks to write an algorithm where I can go from JSON um, or a, a JSON in a very particular format um, to the graph and from the graph back to JSON again. And that includes things like cardinality of nodes. So give you an example in a particular stanza, you might have three VLANs. Well, what you might have is a VLAN node and then you might have three children of that node. Um, and it's how to represent the data. Um, so, and really importantly as well, some data is, is highly sensitive to sequence. So if the sequence in configuration uh, and intent between the device and the graph is incorrect, we could end up with all sorts of problems. To give you an idea, if we run a reconciliation cycle for some other configuration um, and the sequence comes out um, wrong, let's say after three, re re uh, three reconciliations, we get three different kinds of states, we, we've got a problem. So even though the graph doesn't deal with all ordered data uh, necessarily are built in uh, metadata onto each of the graph nodes to ensure always that um, sequencing and order of data is, is maintained between the external world and, and the graph world. And that was just one tiny little problem that, um, that I came, came down to do now. There is so much work to be done on this. It's, this is not a product. It's not something that you're going to go and buy. This is really a huge piece of research that I'm planning on. Um, well, I'm here giving this talk. I gave another one at INOG to try and encourage the world to, to move forward in its hopes uh, and abilities for, for network automation. Um, so the things that we've already discussed, this can load uh, infrastructure as code primitives and drive canonical uh, examples. And, and, there's a, and there's another slide around this, but um, this is a bit that's written in Python. So the idea is I consume um, a metadata file or a structure of data. So I can, Terraform can tell me what it can do in terms of uh, resources. So I get a schema back. Um, using a, a bit of weird logic, I take that schema and I generate and create uh, a JSON schema, uh, individual JSON schemalets, and then I create canonical examples. So well, one of the biggest problems I think with any any data-driven system is you have to go to the documentation. Um, and the idea really should be, I want a browser-based system that uh, I can go off uh, and query and say, right, well, how do I how do I create a VLAN on this system? And um, this is exactly what I've got. So I can go and say, well, it's this kind of device. It's you know this kind of resource that I want. Tell me how it looks. And, and the browser will actually tell me the inputs that are expected, required fields, that kind of thing. Um, which means then I can, I can skin this with a UI further down the line if I have to, because everything's model-derived and it happens to be Terraform is, is driving the modeling, um, certainly from the, the, the campus point of view, um, from the data structure point of view. But when it comes to self-driving, um, this is work in progress and I haven't solved this yet. And I made a point a while ago, I need to go off and develop some GPU skills um, because I think what we actually need for this, instead of having uh, influx database um, and some, some logical triggers uh, over time, um, that, that the problem with that is over time, the more data that goes in, the more cardinality that you have, or that let's say the, the different fields of data that you, that you have going into that database, um, the, the disk IO just massively increases and climbs CPU, just kind of rockets up. Um, and we've got a scalability problem. And I'm not talking about um, whatever he talks about, how to make this thing internet scale, but the, the problem is for us, networks and the amount of data they can emit was already a, a, a becoming to be a bit of a problem with SNMP anyway. But with telemetry, uh, where we can stream data every you know five seconds, every ten seconds, it's a huge problem. Um, and what 
uh, I'd love to be able to do is consume all of that data in this kind of actor framework. So it's a stream based real time processing system, massively parallel um, with, with streams and, and things talking to each other. And I'm of opinion, and I, I'm really kind of running out of time to go any deeper on this, but with, with some GPU processing, we can take that telemetry information, pre cook it almost like you would with a, with a routing algorithm, and then take the metadata and put it back on the graph for analysis. Um, so I've got a huge amount of work to do on that and also creating relationships between config and ops. I've got the algorithm sorted out now um, i just haven't got around to, to implementing implementing that piece so where we could be is i think a much better place you know if we have this treasure map there is a whole pile of treasure that we could go after here just as an industry i think it'd be absolutely amazing um, telemetry is emerging we've got open config models um, which are slowly uh, kind of getting there we've got protocols like pgp monitoring uh, protocol which are really really helpful we can go templateless we can throw ginger 2 away and all of these kind of horrendous workflows that just automate the keyboard um, we've got machine friendly data which means our tool chains can be uh, a lot more reliable especially as a system can describe data to another system fantastic we can remove humans from jumping on devices and removing those cli checks and really just kind of removing the burdens of of um, going device to device, we can go off and query the graph for these kind of relationships and how things are, are, are interrelated. Um, we can have a tight control loop uh, between what we want and what we have, meaning we can put our kind of intent onto the graph, feed that into infrastructure as code tools and have um, an external agent reconcile that almost in real time or through signals if you need to pin things to things like maintenance windows and, and management. And then it really um, gets to this point where we can actually do a proper event driven, not just event while well, interface has gone down, go do something, but we could actually have very complex and, and actual, um, I guess, I don't want to say actual ML, but we, we, we've got at this point enough data points uh, and enough data over time where we can feed them into to algorithms to, to try and get a sense of, well, this is abnormal. Is this an abnormal thing that's just happened with this in interface? And give you an example, CCTV now has this. So if you have a car park outside of your office or home or work um, and nobody hangs around there, but all of a sudden a load of teenagers come along and start partying on the back garden, um, even right now, or in the car parks, or I'd say back on. Even now, um, you can push out algorithms to cameras for that, and the camera will say, "Hey, there's some abnormal behaviour going on here. I don't know what it is, but go take a look." We could be in that position with this level uh, of awareness. It could actually be really quite fantastic. Um, bit of a screenshot for you here. So everything I'm building, um, it's all on web kind of standard stuff. So there's a Swagger API. This example that I mentioned, I can go and query the system for resources. So I'm querying it for a, a, a device type of QFX. Again, sorry, I work for Juniper and I've got access to those devices. Um, a resource name of type VLAN. And on, on the, um, the bottom screen there, you can see the resources that have all been returned that have got VLAN or something to do with the VLAN. Um, from the query. And you can see all the information that goes into those resources. Again, this is a machine schema, something that we can verify and, and validate. We don't have to go off guessing or worry about software upgrades. We can we can just onboard a new um, infrastructure as code Terraform provider uh, and deal with it as and when. And then from an operations point of view, um, where I want to get to between um, orchestration of Terraform resources and operational data is, is kind of uh, what you see here. It's a little bit hard to see, especially the speed that we're running through, uh, but even the relationships are named, which gives us this huge capability. So it means we could actually go, well, what does a path look like from you know, the QFX01 device if down the orchestration branch and what resources lead me to gigabit ethernet 000? Um, and we might find actually there's a piece of configuration and a piece of operational data um, that aren't connected. And that might even mean that we've accidentally put the sub interface in the wrong VRF, for instance. Um, and this is uh, exactly what I've just described here. Um, this is a bit messy. Um, you have to constrain your thinking a little bit, but it gives us this, this normalization layer, something that's not special to be able to deal with a very connected thing, this, this network that really shouldn't be islands of independently managed devices. We can pull out the right level of information uh, and the right level of um, intelligence from these devices. And at that, I'm out of time. I realized I packed way too much into this presentation. Again, this has been a, it's been a, a privilege and an honor to, to present. Um, I was certainly, my heart jumped to beat when I saw the, the message that uh, the talk had been accepted as well. So thank you for, for listening to me rant on and dream on about everything that's been going on. I'm more than happy to chat and answer questions. Um, again, thank you. Uh, you can email me at dave.dev um, or at underscore IP engineer on Twitter. Thank you again. <laughs>
we're going to go right to the Q&A section, and we have approximately five minutes. And there are already two questions in there, and David has indicated that he sees those. David, if you want to go ahead and answer those for the gentleman. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question, uh, what are the shortcomings of the existing tools and the libraries that do support graph models and operations? Uh, what is most needed to, uh, to mature this space? I'm going to answer that one backwards. Um, I, from, I think from a uh, maturation of this space, uh, working groups in communities exactly like this. I think if we could community source uh, kind of operational uh, insights and experience and turn those into practices, I think we could see some a uh, great deal of, of good being done instead of it coming out of the, of the standards bodies. Something like the ITF, um, I think it'd be great to have some of these uh, things crowdsourced. Um, I think this is a very uh, early space. Um, there's lots of good things going on. I think the danger uh, with some of this is is considered secret source for some organizations even the research uh, that i've been doing on this um it's not talked about a whole lot um so i think that'd be great to to, to do that with the community um shortcomings of existing tools and libraries uh and those that do support graph models well libraries um other than using pre-baked uh, off-the-shelf uh, products or kind of open source platforms terraform um, is is great from a, uh, a graph model perspective, from infrastructure as code and modeling resources. From an operations point of view, I'm not aware of a whole amount uh, of tooling out there from, from a graph perspective. Um, I'd love to be able to take this offline and do some more digging on that. I'm going to jump to the uh, to the second question, also from from Michael. Um, so, thoughts on persistence for graph systems, uh, a graph database is necessary. So, I'm going to answer that one immediately. Um, so graph database is necessary. I've experimented with and without the graph systems. Uh, DGraph requires a schema. Arango um, had uh, poor support for Go the last time I checked into it. And um, the library I'm using is Neo4j uh, under everything using Cypher natively and a, a Go library attached to that. Are they really necessary? I think you can achieve a great lot uh, with relational databases. And actually, um, even the, the, the kind of early work that I've got, it's backed by several databases. So there's Neo4j uh, and there's, there's Postgres uh, and there's also... Uh, a key value store as well and, and i'm doing all sorts of interesting things like there are relational tables um and what i'm doing i'm, I'm basically modeling sub trees hashing them uh, and then doing kind of reference checks as as the graph changes it's a bit hard to describe in a, in a couple of minutes um I do think they're necessary for finding the best path between um, between nodes, uh, especially if we're trying to kind of reconcile configuration against operational state, take um, uh, a computation away from that, maybe turn it into an externalized event. So I think they are necessary. I think you can do a great deal without them, though. Um, but I, I've got to kind of put my stick in the ground on that one. Um, and then uh, graph models and, excuse me, uh, Logic moved into the into the services. So I think I think I've answered that. I think that was pretty much one question. Um, I really want to go back to this the, the, the maturation though of of the space. And if anybody is interested in this from this community, I'd love to either uh, work with Nanog. Maybe we can put some kind of a working group together, uh, work offline on this. Um, certainly, we can exchange information. I think there's a there's a huge amount of promise in this space. Um, I think there are no more questions on the Q and A list. So. Uh, Thank you, David. Any more? Uh, I, I appreciate your uh, response to uh, the questions that were asked. Um, thank you for your presentation again. Mm -hmm.